you can't manage risk unless you know what your edge is. You have to know what your expected value is in order to be able to manage risk. And I think the big mistake that people make in investing is that you have risk managers and there are formulas that you can apply to risk. And I think they make an assumption about their expected value and they get really, really focused on the risk management side of things because it's a problem that I think is easier to solve. So Annie has written several books on how to think more efficiently and has tied many of her awesome experiences from being a professional poker player into the books. Two of her books that really stood out to me were Thinking in Bets and Quit. So I'm very excited to learn more about some of the key concepts from these books and discuss how listeners of the show can apply these concepts to make better decisions. So to kick things off, Annie, I'd love for you to just give your backstory in academics and poker and how it relates to your own story of quitting. Yeah, so it's like, it always, I feel like it takes a little bit of time because it actually relates to quitting because I've uh, shifted a lot. I've quit a lot of things. Um, so I started off my adult life at the University of Pennsylvania. I was getting my PhD in cognitive science, which is just broadly, um, you know, how do we as humans uh, create models of the world, right? How, how are we sort of interacting with the world? And uh, so learning, judgment, and decision-making, those kinds of things would, would go under that. Um, so I was... Uh, you know, I'd done my major area exams. I was out on the job market. I had my thesis research finished and I got sick. So uh, I just, I had sort of a, something that was kind of chronic and it turned acute. And I actually ended up in the hospital for a couple of weeks with it. And it was just very clear, like I needed to take a little bit of time off. Um, and so I had to cancel my job talks and fully intending to become an academic and get a tenure track position um, in academics as one does. Uh, you know, so I, I took off and then I was going to, I was going to come back the next year and finish up the next year and go back out on the market. Um, so it was during that time uh, when I was taking time off after being, you know, being there for five years that I started playing poker and I knew a little bit about poker before that because my brother was already a professional poker player and I had watched him play quite a bit and he had brought me out to Las Vegas a few times on just vacations during graduate school, vacations I could not afford on a fellowship. Um, and so I, I played like a, a little bit, but not seriously. And he suggested that maybe I do that because I just honestly, like I really needed money. Um, I didn't have my fellowship anymore. I, I don't, I didn't come from a family that had money. So uh, I just need to be able to support myself. Um, so I started playing poker, which was really kind of ideal for me because um, I, d I didn't know how I was going to feel from day to day. I was still recovering from this illness. And because I was going to go back to academics, I didn't want to, you know, start a career or something like that. So poker seemed like a good thing to do in the meantime. My brother gave me some tips. I already knew some about it from watching him and talking to him about it. And when I started playing, I just started doing really well really quickly. Uh, I was up actually in Montana. Uh, a very weird place to be playing poker, but they had legalized poker. Um, and so I would, you know, go to downtown Billings and go play poker. Kind of strange. Um, even stranger when you realize that at the time that I did this, uh, poker was not on television. Um, and it wasn't, there was no internet poker. So I, you know, I think it's hard for people to, kind of understand what it was like in the olden days in the sense, but pre-2002 that, you know, poker players weren't cool. They weren't on television. Uh, people didn't know who they were. Uh, they didn't even understand the most basic thing, which was that you could make your money playing poker. So when I, when I told people that I was playing poker, that it would generally end up somewhere in the, oh, your husband must make a lot of money or are you going to Gamblers Anonymous? Um, you know, where it's like if you flash forward a decade from there, people were like, oh, my God, that's so cool. Um, so it was a, it was kind of a strange uh, thing to do, um, but I, I loved it. I just I loved it. it. It seemed to me to be just this very practical, real time, high stakes application of the things that I was learning in psychology, um, which is how do you actually make good decision in a kind of environment? where there's so much uncertainty. And that's actually a lot of what I was studying 
in graduate school. And the uncertainty in poker is coming from two places. One is there's just a lot of luck, uh, which obviously people who are in markets know, uh, and poker is just a market. And then there's also a lot of hidden information, which should also sound very familiar. So it's just a very high vol, um, you know, and relatively low information setting. So uh, it's those types of environments where our decision making can go really bad in the form of predictable human error that might occur. So for anybody who's feel familiar with, for example, Daniel Kahneman, uh, that's really what his life's work is about, things like confirmation bias and overconfidence. And in those types of environments, that, that's where those things uh, get the, the worst. So I was really interested in just like really learning the game and trying to solve for these issues. And for eight years, I, I didn't go back to graduate school. Um, I was as ABD as you could get. My dissertation work actually even got published. But, um, but for eight years, I just dove headlong into poker. Then in 2002, uh, when poker sort of got on television, I got asked by a hedge fund to come speak to their options traders about how poker might inform their thinking about risk. Um, and I took it in a little bit of a different direction because I'm kind of a cognitive scientist at heart. Uh, and I talked about how the track that you're on, whether you've been winning or losing recently, really distorts your risk attitudes on your next decision, which is a really big problem that poker players have as well. So I really kind of talked about that issue. Um, broadly in poker, we might put that under a category called tilt, um, uh, which is like uh, when your brain sort of stops working. <laughs> Uh, because you're you're uh, emotional about things that have happened in the past. So I gave that talk. It was really fun. And um, that person, the person, the founder, the managing director of that hedge fund, uh, ended up um, recommending, starting to recommend me to other people. And, uh, you know, and then obviously as poker got on television and I was kind of one of the OGs, you know, I started getting asked to do like events for, businesses. And mostly it started off with people just wanting me to come and like play poker for their like, you know, retreats. Um, and I started really pushing my manager to offer talks because uh, the thing that really happened to me when I gave that first talk was I remembered some, I remembered two things. Uh, the first thing is I remembered that I really do love cognitive science. Um, but the more important thing that I remembered was I love teaching. Um, and I hadn't been doing it, obviously. I'd been teaching myself, but I hadn't been teaching other people. And I, I really wanted to do more of that. So um, I start, you know, I started sort of getting asked to come do these talks, originally a little bit me pushing it, but then just through, you know, word of mouth and whatnot, started building up that business. Actually ended up teaching a little poker on the side too, because I found a way to do a lot of teaching. Um, and then uh, I, sort of around 2012, so I'm doing that in parallel, right? I'm a poker player. And then I'm, I also have developed this whole other thing that I'm doing, which is thinking about the intersection between cognitive science and poker and how those two disciplines might inform each other uh, to make us actually better at both of them. Um, so I, I'm, I'm now doing those things in, in parallel. I start getting asked by uh, some of the people that I speak to if I do consulting. That might be interesting. Uh, so I start doing some of that. And then in 2012, really made the decision to retire from poker completely so that I could focus on this other thing um, that I was doing. And I, that I did. And so my life now is uh, I have a very small roster of clients. Um, I keep them small because I embed. I don't do short-term projects with people. Um, the client that I've been with the shortest amount of time, except I just took on a brand new one, so I'll exclude them. Uh, but in terms of any of my older clients, uh, the shortest amount of time that I've been with any of them is now three years. So I really go deep and long um, with the people that I work with. Uh, and then I also just was really kind of burning to to start writing down the things that I was talking about what I was doing in terms of the work in my consulting work. Uh, and that became first thinking in bets, then how to decide and then quit. Uh, thinking about my next book right now, I'm just starting research on it actually. Um, and then the other fun thing that I did was uh, last year, I had been doing research with Phil Tetlock uh, and Barb Mellers and he wrote Super Forecasting, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, 
both of them completely brilliant. And during COVID, they had asked me to collaborate with them on uh, uh, some research on forecasting. And so um, I did that and I, I sort of became lead investigator on a series of four pretty large scale studies. Um, we found really fun results. And at the end of it, Phil said to me, well, why don't you just write this up? Like it's more than most people do for a dissertation by a lot. Um, and so last year on June 15th, I successfully defended my dissertation and was officially PhD on August 4th. So I told you it would take a long time because it's, a, you know, first of all, I'm old. And second of all, it's a lot of, you know, weaving around. Well, congratulations. Well, thank you. Yeah. So you mentioned Eric Seidel in Thinking in Bets and some of the key lessons he imparted to you. And you said that you had a crush on his intellect at the time. So I really enjoy learning about uh, mentors of people I highly respect like yourself. So I'm just interested. I mean, I'm probably sure you could go hours speaking about the mentors, but maybe could you give me a little bit of information about some of the, the mentors who had the biggest impacts on you, that, whether that's inside the realm of poker or outside and, and why they, they, they were so influential for you? So, uh, you know, academically, it has to start with Barbara Landau, who is now at Johns Hopkins. Um, she was at Columbia at the time. Uh, it was her, her first job out of graduate school, I believe, actually, um, in a tenure track position. And the first week of college, I was looking for a work study job and she was looking for a research assistant and the rest is history. Uh, and so I started working with her and I actually stayed with her for the whole four years that I was in college. And uh, she had actually just come from Penn where her advisors were Lila and Henry Gleitman. And she was, uh, she was amazing because she did something that a really good mentor will do, which is I really wanted to stay at Columbia. I did not want to leave New York. And so I wanted to do graduate school and do my dissertation under her. And she sort of put her foot down and said, no, you really have to go to Penn. Um, I don't think it's good for you to stay with the same person for eight years, uh, which I thought was, or nine years actually, which I thought was pretty amazing. So um, I did end up going to Penn and I studied with Lila and Henry. So they're, they're my next really big mentors in my life. And just, you know, Lila, I, I was close with until she was 91. Um, just really showed me a model of not just incredible intellect, but also compassion. And again, as a good mentor does, while I was, I sort of felt like I had really let her and Henry down by leaving graduate school and going off to become a poker player. She was just so beaming with pride about it, you know? So for her, successful mentorship was me going off and excelling at whatever it was that I did. And it was funny because I had such a, I was still focused on the letting down because I didn't follow in her footsteps that I didn't think like, well, of course she would be proud of a student who went off and became a world champion at the thing that they were doing, you know? So I have to, obviously, there are huge influences in my life. Uh, in poker, my brother, I, you know, clearly he's the one who taught me to play. He was the person who I most uh, kind of like learned from and bounced hands off of. And then Eric Seidel would be the second one who taught me a lot about how to play poker, but, but more his mentorship was so much in the kind of like emotional control and how are you processing like good and bad outcomes and how are you treating like your fellow human beings in terms of the way that you're communicating to them and sort of generosity of intellect and, you know, that kind of stuff. Like he was more, my brother was more teaching me poker and Eric Seidel was teaching me much more about how to behave as a poker player, which I, I, I think it was so important because you, you do do so much. There is so much emotion in poker that if you can't get that in check. Um, you're going to be in really big trouble. And he's so good at it, you know? So he's such a huge influence for me. Um, and then, you know, and then we start to get to, as I, as I move into this next phase, this, the phase that I'm in right now, which, you know, in terms of writing and, you know, and the consulting work and so on and so forth. I mean, obviously Phil and Barb, um, Phil Petlock and Barb Mellers, uh, in terms of the mentorship around like my dissertation and actually completing that work. But then the people that you mentioned, you know, um, Danny Kahneman's been an amazing mentor to me. Uh, 
Michael Mobison and I, you know, catch up all the time. I he's one of my idols. I think that just the way that he thinks and his intellectual curiosity is something to completely aspire to. Um, and so he's definitely been a mentor uh, to me in that way as well. Um, you know, and there, the, you know, and I'm, of course, at the age where mentorship and friendship a little bit gets melded together. Do you know what I mean? Because they're also like Michael's also a very good friend, and um, Danny's a friend. So, and then Katie Milkman sort of in that category where like. I look to her for mentorship, but she's also, you know, my friend. So I'm kind of at that age where it sort of mixes together a little bit. And then I would say the last person in terms of mentorship would be my husband, um, who has, who really helps to guide me. And a lot of what he does is, is help me to find permission to say no to things, which I really do need a lot of mentorship on. So I've been very lucky, actually, and I, I know I'm leaving people out, but I've been very lucky to have some just really awesome, like really incredible mentors in my life. And it's so important, obviously, to where I am now. So in your chat with uh, my colleague, William Green, you mentioned that we all think probabilistically, even if it's not explicit. So you used a great example of when we drive to work and decide which route to take. We're using probabilistic reasoning to determine which route is going to get us there the quickest. So we are using a form of, um, an implicit form, sorry, of expected value to help us determine which route makes the most sense, given the information that we know at the time. But as you pointed out, the real magic happens when we explicitly use probabilistic thinking. So I'm interested, from an investing lens, what can investors take from this, uh, this lesson about uh, probabilistic thinking to help them minimize risk in investing? Yeah, okay, so... First of all, let me just say this, that if you have the expected value right, risk becomes a much less important issue. Uh, this is a concept that I, I really was hit home for me from uh, Jeff Yoss, who's the founder of uh, Susquehanna International Group. Um, and he actually has said risk Smith, Smith. Like what I care about is I'm worried that I think I'm winning when I'm actually losing. Don Moore and Max Bazerman has have written about this where they think everybody should be much more focused on expected value, right? Because if the expectancy is positive, uh, you're, pro you're probably not going to make too big a mistake. Now, obviously, you have to think about risk in the sense of, am I going to have more money to churn through this positive expectancy thing, right? So we definitely want to think about it um, uh, when, we're, when we're in that sort of risk of ruin category. So that's going to be particularly important when we're in a higher volatility situation. So in poker, we do actually think about this quite a bit. But you have to know what your edge is, right? I mean, that's that's the thing, right? So you have to have a good sense of what your edge is, which is really an expected value problem, right? So because uh, you can't expect calculate expected value without knowing what, what your edge is, right? So you have to know what your edge is in order to start to manage risk well. Um, so, you know, obviously, assuming that you're in a low vol, if you're in a low vol situation, you're probably never going to make too much of a mistake as long as you have a positive expectancy. Uh, but if you're in a high vol situation, you do actually have to start to think about that more deeply. In poker, um, you know, we were just applying something that was very similar to Kelly, basically, which is like, you know, it's essentially bet your edge, right? And um, a little bit the way that I think about Kelly is, first of all, just how confident are you of what your edge is? Because I think that the less confident that you are about your edge, the more that you should be moving into like half Kelly, quarter Kelly, that kind of thing, because you, you really just have to give yourself a cushion on that. Um, you know, and then there's just also your tolerance for going broke. How easy is the money to replace and things like that? So I tended, you know, in poker, I tended to to bet somewhere around no, never more than 5% of my total bankroll would be in play at any time. Um, but usually it was more in the two and a half percent range. So that would have been a bullish to half Kelly kind of situation. But the, but, but again, the thing about all of this is that with risk, it's like you can't manage risk unless you know what your edge is. You have to know what your expected value is in order to be able to manage risk. 
And I think the big mistake that people make in investing is that you have risk managers and there are formulas that you can apply to risk. And I think they make an assumption about their expected value and they get really, really focused on the risk management side of things um, because it's a, a problem that I think is easier to solve. In other words, if you have an assumption about what your EV is and what the vol is, right, now you can actually just apply a formula and you could start to get into some, you know, you sort of dive headlong into, into the risk management side of things. And that's Jeff Yass's point, is that he feels like people are making too many assumptions about the EV part. Just like, what is your edge in the first place, right? And I think everybody comes in assuming they have an edge. And then they go to all of these risk management formulas, right? And he's like, I don't even care about that. Like, I'm just so afraid that I think I'm winning when I'm actually losing. And I think that's the thing that people really need to be thinking about when it comes to expected value. And it's one of the reasons why you really want to make it explicit. So how do you, how would someone really go over finding their edge? I mean, I guess you'd have to just, it's all from experience, right? And and you can't just kind of snap your fingers and have this number in your head. You kind of have to base it off of your prior experiences and and kind of go from there. Is that how you would coach someone to do it? So prior experience matters, but not as much as the base rate. So, so uh, you know, and I, I, this is something Michael Mobison just like hits home so well. Um, you know, the, the thing that he is always saying, and I've seen a lot of talks that he's given, the way we normally go about making decisions is we think about the problem that we're approaching, and then our own experiences. And then we use that to decide what we think our EV is going to be. So, uh, you know, if I'm in, in um, you know, if I'm trading and I'm, I'm thinking about a particular thesis that I might trade or whatever, I'm going to be thinking about how smart I am and how unique the thesis is and, um, you know, so and so forth. And I, you know, my past experiences with winning and um, all of that. But what I should really do to start with is his point is before I get to my own experience, I have to start with the base rate. So le- let me give you an example. Let's imagine that I'm thinking about opening up a restaurant. And I've worked in restaurants before and the chefs that I've worked for have said that I'm amazing and I'm a great cook and the customers are always complimenting my food And now I'm opening up my own joint and I'm thinking about how much people love my food and how busy the other restaurants I've been in have been. And I estimate that the probability that my restaurant is going to thrive um, is 80%. Because notice I'm thinking about all these things that are personal to my experience and how much people love the food that I make and how good a cook I am and Um, how well the restaurants that I've been in have done and so on and so forth that I've cooked in have done. Uh, But that's not the place that I want to start. But that stuff matters. But what I actually want to start is with the base rate. And so what I want to think about is uh, what usually happens in a situation that's similar to the one that I'm considering. Okay. So this is going to give you, in investor speak, beta. You You need to know what beta is. So in restaurants, if I think about, if I actually look up what percentage of first-time restaurants uh, are still open at the end of the first year, survive a year, it's 40%. Okay, so now I'm going to start with 40%. And now I can say all those same things. I'm a great cook. People love my food. Uh, Customers are always complimenting me uh, at the restaurants that I've cooked for, the chefs that I've worked with. Um, have said that I'm amazing and I should open my own joint. And so I think that my chances are better than 40%, but not 80%, right? Like I'm not doubling my chances here. So this allows me to get grounded in a reality that I can now toggle up or down from. So we can look at that, we can find the base rate and then we can say, Do my particular circumstances, do I think it makes it more likely or less likely that I'm going to succeed, you know, independent of the base rate? Now, we can use this concept um, in terms of like historical averages also. So uh, if I want to, if I want to make a guess at what my Q2 target should be, right? 
I shouldn't go by what my board wants it to be. I should look at what has on average like growth been year over year. And then I can absolutely historically look because we again, base rates are interesting, right? Like because it's not um, there's some art to base rates because you have to find the right what's called reference class. You have to find the right sort of situation similar to the one that you're considering. So I can look at growth year over year, but then I can also look at what happened, what has historically happened between Q1 and Q2. If my company has been around long enough, I can look what's historically happened within my own company because there may be seasonality, for example, or I can look in the industry in general, right? So this is now you can see it's going to help me get a starting point, right? So let's imagine that quarter over quarter growth in uh, net new ARR has been um, recently 10%. But then I also see that there's a seasonality component where my sales actually go up in June, Q2, more than I would expect them to go up between like Q3 and Q4 and Q, uh, Q1. Uh, so maybe I bring it up then and I say, actually, the seasonality is working in my favor because that usually gives you an extra 50%. So I say, OK, I think it's actually going to go up 15%. And then I uh, but my sales leader is about to exit. So that's something else is personal to me. My sales leader is about to exit, so maybe I should toggle it back down, right? So you can see how you can now use this to ground you in reality to get to a more reasonable place in, in terms of what your forecast might be. So I know that feedback loops are your obsession. So when I think about feedback loops myself, I think a lot about jujitsu, an activity that I'm very fond of. So the beautiful part about jujitsu is that feedback loops are pretty much instantaneous. You know, I can, I can try a new move or a new submission and instantly I know it works. The, my opponent taps or it doesn't work, they escape. Um, but obviously in investing, those feedback loops aren't instantaneous. They, you might make a decision today and you might not actually know if that decision was good or bad a couple of years out. So I'm really interested in knowing how do you best close feedback loops on decisions where the outcomes won't be clear for a few years? Oh, I'm so excited that you asked me that because it's one of my favorite things to talk about. So uh, two of my very long-term clients are uh, venture firms. And they're both early stage. One is focused on seed. That's first round capital partners. I'm a special partner there. And then uh, the other is focused more kind of in the Series B area, uh, and that would be Renegade. Uh, love them both. So prior to my working with them, I had uh, lots of, I was invited to talk to partners at a variety of different venture firms. And they all kind of said two things to me, which I thought was interesting, um, because I, I heard an echo through the whole industry. One is you can't really close feedback loops appropriately um, in the way that you talk about in Thinking in Bets. So this was after Thinking in Bets came out where I talked, you know, there's this obsession in Thinking in Bets about closing feedback loops. They said, oh, you can't do that when there's power law, like when power law applies. And just for those people who, who, who might not know what power law is, uh, it's when uh, you have a very small number of winners that win a ton, right? But most things die. So this should sound very much like venture. Um, it's actually a little bit like uh, social media where like 2% of the users are producing all of the content and everybody else is kind of quiet. Um, so, you know, the power law applies in a variety of different places, but it definitely applies to venture. And so their point was, well, you know, if everything's dying and you only have a couple winners, like you could never tell anything about the quality of your decision. Uh, and the second thing that they, they said was the feedback loops are too long. Uh, if you're investing at seed, uh, it's going to be five or 10 years, really, uh, before you get whatever the outcome is. Okay. So I said the same thing to all of them. Uh, and it was only when I got to first round and to renegade that they went, oh, okay, I hear what you're saying. And this is why I work with them. Um, I, and it's all, and in particular, renegade was new. Josh Koppelman was the one that I originally talked to, who's the founder of First Round. And he he's so tremendously successful. So I just want to give like a big shout out to him because somebody that successful doesn't need to be open to changing the way that they think about things, right? And very often aren't open. And he he was completely open 
to changing the way that, that he was thinking about this. So let me tell you what I said to them, because this is the answer to your questions. I said, what do you mean the feedback loops are long? And they said, what do you mean? We don't know if it excerpts for, you know, and I said, I'm sorry, do you invest in the company? And then you go to sleep like Rip Van Winkle. And 10 years later, you wake up and you find out what happened. When you invest in a company, a couple of things are true. Two different category of things are true, all of which, both of which allow you to close the feedback loop more quickly. Thing number one is that you actually know objective things about the company. You know whether uh, ARR is growing. You know whether they're hiring top talent and retaining the top talent. You know whether they fund a Series A. You know whether it's an up round, a flat round, a down round. You know what the quality of the syndicate is. Same thing for B, same thing for C. And if you're, you know, depending on the speed of the market, if you invest at seed, for example, you're going to know something very significant about that company between six and 16 months later. That sounds like a lot faster than 10 years. So that's, that's you know, the first thing that you know. The second thing, and this is true across all investing, is that you're investing in the company because you're making a particular bet. And the bet is your thesis, right? So if it's in the market, you're saying, I think that I know something that the market doesn't know. Why do I know that that's what your thesis is? Because otherwise you would be indexing the market. You're not indexing the market. So you're saying, I believe that the market has this mispriced temporarily. I believe the market is efficient, but you know, not at every single moment, right? Like it's overall efficient, right? So I believe that at this moment, when it comes to this stock or whatever, this stock or this option, the market is not, does not have this price efficiently. So you have a thesis about why that is true. It's true when you're investing in a company, right? I, I believe that this market is going to be a great market to be in. This product is going to have a competitive advantage. They're going to execute in this particular way, so on and so forth. And those kinds of things you can find out very quickly, even when you're investing in a seed stage company. You can see, like, are they executing in the way that I thought they were? Is their product gaining traction? Right? Like, so on and so forth. Right? So all of these things, like, look, is it like poker or jujitsu where you're going to find out two seconds later? No, but you're going to find out way more than 10 years. And so... That's what we're obsessed with, right, is how are we thinking about the way that we can grade these companies as they develop, where we know things about the quality of the decision long before 10 years is up. And the other thing that's really important to know is that, again, because of the power law issue, there's lots and lots of companies that die that were great investments because there's a lot of luck that's happening, right? Like, do you have a company that COVID, it just destroys, right? Or whatever, right? So you want to be able to see the companies that you wanted to have in your portfolio, regardless of whether they ended up being fund returners or exited for over a billion dollars. And you can only do that if you're actually tracking these things that you know are necessary but not sufficient for them to get a billion dollars, to a billion dollars. And that all translates perfectly onto, for example, people who have long short funds, right? Where most of the long, if you're a value investor, is long hold, right? And so you need to start saying, okay, but I don't want to not know for five years, what are the things that's happening with this company that I've invested in, given what my thesis was for why the market was inefficient here, and are those things unfolding? So I just never accept, ever, that the feedback loop is too long to be able to do anything with. So in your conversation with Howard Marks, you discussed a lot about the role of luck that you just brought up and how that plays in outcomes. So this has been a fascinating area for me that I spend a lot of time thinking about. So you said, quote, in the short run, there's just way too much luck. So as an example, if, if Howard and I were betting and he said, I'm going to lay you two to one on a coin flip, a coin being 50-50, I'm going to make 50% on every dollar that I bet there. 
If I call heads and it lands tails, it means nothing. Now, if we were to do it a thousand times and I kept losing, then I could start to draw some conclusions from the outcome, like maybe Howard isn't using a fair coin, unquote. So from an investing view, this shows how hard it can be to evaluate ourselves on a single decision. So, you know, was the outcome a product of luck or skill? I think you would agree that a lot of outcomes, like you've already said, are, are probably a combination of both of those things. But what steps do you think we need to take to better understand if our process is generating the outcome we want rather than just plain luck? Yeah, okay. So obviously, you know, in the lot, like in poker at the end of a year, assuming you've played 1,000 to 1,500 hours of poker, uh, your results have very little influence of luck on them. Uh, very different than one hand of poker, right? So what we're trying to do is generate enough data points to start understanding the luck still differential. So this goes back to what I just what I just said. So let's imagine that I'm a venture fund and I'm only going to make 20 bets in a fund or I'm a long short investor and maybe I'm at any given time I'm going to have seven positions. Right? So now now you're sitting here going well how am I ever supposed to know if my process is good, right? Because it seven coin flips also doesn't tell you very much, right? So um, uh, if I'm sort of just waiting for the outcome of those things, it's it's not going to help me very much, right? Like, so a great investor, if their fund has 20 companies in it, could have a fund that returns 0.8, could have a fund that returns 40x, and it's the exact same investor. How do you get started with stock investing? I've put together a course to teach you everything I wish I knew when I first started investing in stocks. Let's start at the beginning and ask, what is a stock? Let's zoom on in into what it's actually like to buy a stock. A few options are Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, Ally, E-Trade. Fortunately, you won't have to necessarily calculate all of these taxes yourself. I'll outline a few main ones to be aware of throughout your lifetime investing journey. As Warren Buffett says, your best investment is yourself. There's nothing that compares to it. By the end, you'll be savvier about stock investing and personal finance than the vast majority of people. Even if you're not a total beginner, I'm confident you'll get a lot out of the principles and strategies I outline, which we'll build on throughout. A link to the course is available in the description below. See you there. Right. So just to kind of, you know, it's like, did you get Uber in there? Right. All right. So, so the way that we deal with that is to create more outcomes in those types of environments. So notice I don't have to do that in poker because in poker, I'm, psych I'm churning money through that system so quickly that I'm getting, I'm getting enough outcomes to start to draw conclusions, particularly if I combine that with really deep dives on like a process or, or my thinking process during a hand where I'm hiding the outcome from the person that I'm doing that deep dive with. So I, I can kind of do that in poker, right? But how do we deal with that in a situation where your portfolio might have seven positions at a time, for example, or in venture where maybe you have 20 companies or 25 companies in, your, in, in a fund, right? And it's, you're generating uh, more outcome than the final outcome. So it goes back to what I'm saying. So, so let's imagine this. Let's imagine that you're an investor investing in Series A. That's your specialty. And for every single company, Every company that comes into partner meeting, you have to make a forecast of the probability that that company will fund its Series B. Now, you can put restrictions around it, right? Like, you know, you can say the probability that it will fund its Series B with an up round, right? So you can do whatever you want. So, so we can think about what are those things that are really necessary for this to survive? Because the thing is, I, I can guarantee you, you won't ever have a fund returner if you invest at Series A that doesn't invest at Series B, likely not a down round, right? Uh, which is a bad sign. Okay, so so let's take that one data point, right? But then you can now gener you can actually think about what are all the data points that I now want to be making predictions about where I'm going to start to know those things more quickly. Now, what's nice about that is it does double duty. One is it massively increases the outcomes that you have so that you can get more into the thousand coin flip situation, right? Because if you have, let's imagine that you have a hundred companies come into partner meeting um, in a year and you've made that 
that we're just talking about the one forecast right now, you've made that one forecast for all 100 companies, you know, in the space of 18 months, you're going to know for every single one of those companies because you can, it's public whether they, they do a B. How good, how good of a, a predictor am I of this particular thing? That really, really matters. Okay, so so you so now you you start to be able to close these feedback loops faster because you're generating so much more data that we start to remove the luck and it becomes about sort of your predictive power, right? Do you actually have the situation modeled correctly, right? Now the other thing that's really good about that, if we go back to this idea of implicit versus explicit, is that if you're going to do that, you're actually making the decision process explicit instead of implicit. In other words, when you make an investment, when you put something in your portfolio, it is implicit that what you're doing is making a prediction about the future. So you're you're judging certain things. So in venture, it might be the quality of the market, the quality of the team, the quality of the products, whatever, um, uh, you know, so and so when we can think about, you know, uh, components of those things, like uh, what's the competitive landscape look like? Is it favorable to the company? You know, obviously, in um, uh, if you're putting a company in your portfolio in the form of a stock, you're going to have some sort of thesis about it might be that uh, this company is going to perform really well in a high interest rate environment. And you have a, so you're, you have a prediction that interest rates are going up. As an example, you know, you believe that um, there's been a bottleneck uh, in terms of um supply chain and you believe that it's closer to solve, you know, the company's closer to solving the bottleneck than the market believes. And so your your prediction of the number of widgets that company is going to produce in the next two quarters is just way higher than, for example, what the guidance might be. All right. So so we can think of a variety of things. I just like made those up, but you can imagine what those things are, right? Okay. So if we know that those things are included in the decision, then making explicit predictions and judgments about those things. So just like, for example, with a company, um, I can make a judgment of on a scale of one to seven, how strong do I think this market is that the company is going to be entering into, right? So I can and make that judgment about every single company that I'm seeing. Now, not only do I have tons and tons and tons of predictions where those outcomes are going to come more quickly, so that I can get more to a thousand coin flips more quickly and figure out if my thinking is pretty good around this. But I've also made the components of the decision explicit, which is really important for reducing bias and noise. So I've said explicitly, this is the, here are the, here's what would have to be true for me to invest in the company. Let me actually make judgments about those things that would have to be true that I would care about. And it makes it less likely that you can tell a narrative that just gets you to a conclusion that you want to get to. And the fact that you know you're going to be accountable to it also disciplines you to reality. So you were asked how you thought lessons from poker transferred to other areas of life. And you went into some excellent details, but I want to highlight a few things you said, quote, the transfer of training from one domain to another is pretty dismal, unquote. And then you talked about some concepts of near transfer and far transfer. So I'm just interested in knowing if you can um, explain these concepts of near and far transfer in a little more detail. Plato wrote about this idea that I think would it's probably intuitive to you, since intuitive to me, uh, which is if you teach people to solve hard problems, like hard math problems, that uh, they'll be better at other problems as well. So I was actually just talking to a researcher yesterday who said, you know, there was an intuition that if you teach people to get really good at chess, that they'll be really good thinkers and they'll be great at other things. Um, and it turns out uh, that Plato was wrong and that's not true. And we've known that way back since the early 1900s with a guy named Thorndike who uh, just showed that, right? Like if, you, if, you, if I make you solve trigonometry problems and I get you to be pretty good at that, it doesn't make you better at anything else. Now, I, I, I assume, Kyle, you find that intuitively not like you're like, really, that doesn't seem like it's true. But it is. Um, so if you become good at chess, you're becoming good at chess. Is basically the answer. You're, it's not helping you with other stuff. Uh, and if you become good at trigonometry, you're good at trigonometry. 
I, so that's sort of in-domain learning, not transferring. Okay, so you can get some near transfer. So near transfer would be problems that are very, very similar, right? So if you learn to be really good at checkers, that probably helps you with chess. But those things are close to each other, right? But the question is, can you get far transfer? So far transfer is domains that are very unrelated to each other. So if you learn to be very good at chess, does that mean that when I go and ask you to go be a stock trader, so those things are pretty far away from each other, that that's going to help you? And the answer is no, it will not. So that's that idea of near transfer versus far transfer. Now, here's where I think uh, poker is really helpful. Um, and where I think that our education system could do a better job. In fact, I founded, a, a, co-founded a um, nonprofit called the Alliance for Decision Education, which is really trying to uh, teach kids to be better decision makers broadly. Um, so there is a way to get transfer of training, but the way to do it is that you have to dig down into the conceptual level. So the issue with transfer is that like if you tell most people about Archimedes getting in a bathtub in the water displacing, they're not going to relate it to anything except for like bathtub water displacing. So they're going to understand that like if you put something in a sink, it'll d- displace the water, right? But, um, you know, obviously that's, he wasn't talking about water displace. He was fig- trying to figure out how to figure out if a crown was made of gold, right? So it was a measure, you know, it was broadly about measurement and how can we measure things and density and so on and so forth. So you have to, you have to get down to this very conceptual level. And um, the kinds of concepts actually that transfer really well are things where you're sort of taking advantage of the fact that we're intuitive statisticians. Now, we're not great intuitive statisticians. I want to just say that like our, our sense statistically of what should be true or not isn't fantastic, which is why people can make money in the market because if people were good intuitive statisticians, they would obviously be better at that. But we do all sort of apply a little bit like the, these concepts, like take, for example, the law of large numbers, right? Um, we all sort of intuitively know that one data point probably isn't enough to tell you anything, even though we reason by an- anecdote a lot. Uh, but if you sort of step back from that intellectually and say, yeah, but that's one person, you know, people are like, yeah, you know, they kind of get that. So, um, so what the research has shown is that if you want to get transfer, far transfer to very disparate domains, um, teaching statistical concepts is actually the best way to do it, right? So you have to get way down deep to the underpinning, right? So if I teach you about the law of large numbers as applied to uh, uh, pulling ball, different colored balls from an urn, then when I ask you what you can surmise about a baseball player's batting average for the year from their first seven at bats, you will recognize pretty quickly that probably not too much, right? So, um, so that's true, for example, for concepts like uh, equilibrium or regression to the mean. I can teach you about regression to the mean and you can apply that across all sorts of different domains. I can teach you about base rates and you can apply that across all sorts of different domains. So it turns out if we can actually teach people sort of the underlying idea of like these statistical concepts, proportionality would be another one um, that you don't want to just think about the numerator probably want to think about the denominator as well. That's really helpful. Then you can get this far transfer. And I think that that's where poker is really helpful because um, it's very hard to be really good at poker uh, if you can't, if you're not actually thinking about those types of statistical, like the statistical concept. That's not to say that there aren't people who aren't good at poker who don't think that way, who really are kind of just good at poker. But somebody like Eric Seidel, for example, who's good in sort of all different types of poker and so on and so forth. He understands the underpinnings and that that's going to transfer well to other domains. For example, he used to trade options and did a great job of it. There's a very successful investing partnership. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of it called the Nomad Investment Partnership that published its annual letters. And in it, they discuss the concept of destination analysis, which is an analytical tool that they use to help them determine if the destination of a business was good or bad. And if it was obvious to them that they could actually see what that would look like years into the future. 
So when I do my own destination analysis, I like to add a segment where I would list off the events that have to happen for them to never reach that destination uh, that I thought that they could hopefully achieve. So I call it my losing playbook, which helped me be more objective when an investment started going bad. So when I read about your concept of the kill criteria, it immediately resonated with me. So one thing I noted was that you emphasize that the kill criteria needs to have a state and a date. So do you mind going over the concept of kill criteria and discussing it um, in a little more detail in terms of improving decision making for long term oriented investors? Yeah, so so there's there's two separate concepts in here in terms of what you just talked about, like what what would need to be true in order for them to like not succeed, what would need to be true in order for them to succeed. So we can think about that generally as uh, bottleneck problems, right? Like they had to solve there are certain bottlenecks that are going to either they they solve them or they don't. Um, and if they can't, then they're not going to succeed. And if they can, then necessary, but not sufficient for success, right? All right so the first place that we want to start before we get to kill criteria is a concept called monkeys and pedestals. Um, and monkeys and pedestals is uh, basically, it goes like this. Um, let's imagine that you're, you've decided that you're going to leave your podcast uh, and stop investing. Uh, because what you really want to do is train a monkey to juggle flaming torches while standing on a pedestal in the town square. Uh, and if you did that, I, people would throw a lot of money in your hat. That's a pretty spectacular thing to train a monkey to do. Um, uh, so we can say there's two parts to this act that you're going to build. Uh, one is training the monkey to juggle the flaming torches, and the other is building the pedestal. Uh, and the pedestal uh, is not the place that you should start. And the reason that you shouldn't start there is that you already know you can build the pedestal. The thing that you don't know, the bottleneck to success, is whether you can train that monkey or not. So, so first of all, you should start there. And second of all, when you're thinking about, uh, is this an investable business? Should I actually spend my time doing this? That's where you want to say, like, what's the probability that I can actually get the monkey to actually juggle these flaming torches? Because that's the thing that matters the most. Okay, so um, in any project that you approach, there are, there are monkeys. Um, or any investment that you make as you're thinking about what needs to be true for this to be a successful investment um, or for it to fail. Uh, one is a pre-mortem, one would be a backcast. Um, there are monkeys and then there are pedestals. And so, for example, coding is a pedestal because you can kind of code everything, right? Achieving product market fit is a monkey, right? So, that's sort of the idea, right? So it's not, I'm not saying coding's not hard and it's not work. It's that you already know you can do it. So once we've identified the monkeys, now we can start to develop kill criteria around those things. And basically it's, I didn't solve this monkey. Looking back, I saw that there were early signal that there was no way that I was going to solve that monkey. What were those early signals? And now you can sort of write down a list of what, what those things are. Like, what are the things that would tell me that I ought to kill? So uh, an example that, that, I would, uh, that I give sometimes is like, let, let's imagine that you have a thesis around Bitcoin. So you invest in Bitcoin and your, your thesis is uh, that it will be a hedge against inflation. Okay, so we, we automatically, like, that's a very, we know what the bottleneck is, right? Like, what if it isn't? So now we can just say, okay, let's imagine that inflation uh, soars and Bitcoin goes down while inflation is soaring. Um, and looking back, I could kind of see that that was going to happen and I held on to it too long. You know, what are the signals? And then you can you set those things out. So you can say the correlation has to be this high and persistent for this period of time. Uh, and then I'm going to kill. So that brings up the states and dates problem is it's not enough just to say, well, if it turns out that it's, you know, not a good hedge against inflation, I'm going to sell. And the reason is that once you're kind of in it, particularly as you're taking on losses, you're just very unlikely to actually sell unless you set a, a state and a date. So the state and date here, for example, if we say uh, the correlation has to be this, has to be above this correlation. So that's the state. For this period of time, that's the date. Okay, so so the simplest example of this would just be a stop loss. So you 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 can set a date to it, 
But a stop loss is really just a state, right? And in this particular case, it's fine because it's a trigger. Um, I bought it at 50. If it's trading at 40, I have to sell it. So that's a very, very simple version of a kill criteria. Um, another one is like if you're summoning Everest, if I'm not at the summit by 1 p.m., I have to turn around. Right. And so that, again, it combines a state and a date. Um, and it, it, it creates a pre-commitment device that makes it much more likely that you're going to walk away when you ought to instead of hanging on to things too long. And we know that people tend to hang on to things way too long. And so you're trying to basically counteract that particular bias of hanging on to your losers, which I'm sure everybody who listens to this has done before and has felt. Um, the one thing that I just want to just sort of say explicitly is that every thesis, every investment thesis, every bet that you make, kill criteria are implied. If I, if I invest in Bitcoin because I think it's going to be a hedge against inflation, you sort of, you think intuitively that, well, then if it turns out that it's correlated with inflation, then obviously I'm going to, or in, in this case, negatively correlated, um, then obviously I'm going to sell. And it just turns out that that intuition is just really bonkers and wrong. And you just need to let go of the idea that you're going to behave rationally under that. So by setting kill criteria in advance, you just make it much more likely that you'll actually act, act rationally. And here's the important thing to what your own thinking is, because it's your thesis, not somebody else's, right? So you'll, you're more likely to behave rationally in relation to your own thesis if when you generate the thesis, when you generate the bet, that you actually write down what these criteria are for why, when you would exit. I really enjoyed your detailed breakdown of the endowment effect, especially how it's affected by consensus versus non-consensus views. So value investors tend to explicitly try and hold non-consensus views. So it would appear that they would put themselves at a higher risk of suffering from the endowment effect as they are more likely to double down on their thesis, even in the face of disconfirming evidence. So I'm interested in knowing what some of the best strategies to use so we can try to detach our identity from our investments to help reduce the negative impacts of the endowment effect? Yeah, so uh, so first of all, let me just explain what the endowment effect is. So um, the endowment effect is, uh, it was originally about ownership of objects. So um, if I own a particular model of car, um, I'm going to think it's more valuable than a identical car that I do not own. So, and I think we've all had that feeling of like, we're going to sell a used car and they, you know, we get offered a, we look at the Kelly Blue Book and we're like highway robbery. Kelly Blue Book is wrong. That's completely ridiculous. My car is worth more than that. Um, but then when we go to buy an identical car, we're always like highway robbery. You have this price too high. So, um, uh, but it turns out that the endowment effect is not just about items that we might own. It's also about ideas. So we value uh, our own ideas uh, more than the identical ideas that other people might generate. Um, we've all had that feeling in meetings. And obviously, um, you know, what, what ends up happening is that we can kind of think about it as, you know, we have ownership over our ideas and our own theses and, you know, the investments that we have, we, we both own physically, but also it's our idea. Um, and then when we start to get into this consensus versus non-consensus problem, what ends up happening is that um, identity starts to get mucked up in there. So when I have a consensus point of view, my identity isn't nearly as tied into that point of view as when I have a non-consensus point of view. Because if I have a consensus point of view, my my view is not unique. So if it turns out that that's not true, my identity is not going to be nearly as threatened. Um, th so I, I try to think about it like, you know, I used to believe Pluto was a planet, but so did everybody else. So when scientists told me that Pluto wasn't a planet, I was like, OK, I don't care. <laughs> Pluto is not a planet, whatever. But for flat earthers. You know, it kind of doesn't matter how much evidence you give them. They just believe the Earth is flat um, because it's a, it's a real stake in the ground. Right. Like. It's part of who you are. And so this happens when we're, we're sort of contrarians, right? When we're taking a contrarian point of view, uh, it's much harder for us to update rationally in the face of new evidence than when we have a non-contrarian point of view. Uh, so this is really, as you pointed out, like an investor's dilemma. 
you know, at least unless you're indexing, then, you know, otherwise it's an investor's dilemma. So the way that we solve for these kinds of things is twofold. One we already talked about, which is you really have to set really good kill criteria. Because when you're going to be at your most rational is when you're thinking about uh, something that's happening in the future. Because when you think about something that's happening in the future, uh, it doesn't feel like you. Right. And I, I'm sure you've had, you know, that feeling of committing to something that's six months away because it's like you don't feel like you're the one who's actually going to have to do that. And then it gets to be the day before and you're like, why did I ever agree to this? Because all of a sudden now it's about you. Right. So by by thinking about kill criteria in advance, you're you're sort of becoming a good advisor to a future version of you who's going to be subject to the endowment effect and these issues of internal and external validity, which is this fancy way to say your identity. So that's the first thing you can do. The second thing, and this I think is so incredibly important, is to get yourself an outside advisor, um, some sort of coach, a quitting coach, uh, that's going to help you to see the situation more clearly than you might see it yourself. So uh, like Eric Seidel was very helpful uh, for me um, in that role, sort of as an outside person that I could go and say, hey, well, you know, what do you think about how I played a hand? Because when I play a hand, that that's my idea. That's my identity. I don't want to be told that I'm wrong about it. So I go and talk to him so he can help me figure out if that that's a particular idea that I ought to quit. So, um, you know, and one of the things that I think is so fun is Daniel Kahneman um, ta- has told me that he has a quitting coach because researchers start lines of research and then tend to hang on to them too long. Uh, and he doesn't want to do that because he wants to use his time efficiently. And his, his, uh, his quitting coach is Richard Thaler, who's also a Nobel laureate. Should we all be so lucky? Um, but he actually uses that to figure out, like, should I still be pursuing this line of research? Is this too much of a dead end? Are there enough signals that tell me that I should drop it? Um, so we all, we all kind of need those types of people. Now, the best thing that you can do is combine the two. So when you're, when you're going into an investment, you're putting a position on, set out kill criteria. It's, it's actually very helpful to have an outside view on the kill criteria itself. And then now you're committing with somebody else that you're going to follow the kill criteria. And that's really helpful because then when you see them later and they're like, oh, you must have sold Bitcoin because I saw what happened in terms of that correlation. Boy, are you embarrassed if you didn't actually do that because you committed to do that with them. So these are all things, the the way that you can think about it is like, you want to help your future self by getting an actual outside view, right? Somebody who's not, doesn't, isn't endowed to the position in the way that you are. But then also by advising that future version of you, which from your cognitive standpoint is not even you in the first place. So it's, you sort of become an outside advisor to yourself. And both of those things will help you to act much more rationally. Those are excellent. So you mentioned the outside view and I I actually wanted to ask you specifically about that. So the first person who I learned that from was Michael J. Mobison from his excellent book, uh, Think Twice. And so for me, the kind of the one of the one of the ways I like to look, use the outside view is um, I'll look at my portfolio and then I'll imagine myself inheriting the portfolio from somebody else. And I'll ask myself, you know, what if if I if I got this today, what would I want to want to sell? What would I want to hold on to? What would I want to add more of? So I'm just interested in, in, in learning more about what you think of the outside view and how you use it to help combat some of the biases. Obviously, the endowment effect works great with that, but I'd, I'd love to know more about your thoughts on that. Okay, so I'm now going to make this podcast like super worth your time. The thing that you just said doesn't help. So um, so let me explain. Uh, but, but it's very common, right? So I hear people all the time say, well, imagine that you didn't own any of this, right? What would you buy? And the, the reason that you, you intuitively think that that will help is because you do know about the endowment effect. You do know about the sunk cost effect. You know about all those things so that you think that doing this thought experiment, well, what if I were fresh to the decision? You're sort of imagining you're fresh to the decision, that it would be helpful. The science shows very clearly that that is not helpful. It's actually in some ways counterproductive because you fooled yourself into thinking that you're being rational about it. 
So it's it's a question of like when you say, would I start this today? Right. Um, you think that you've solved the problem. So let me just take it back a step. What we're trying to do to get to be rational is only continue to do things that we would start today. Assuming there's no transaction costs. Obviously, otherwise you have to take those into account. But let's be simple and say there's no transaction costs. Okay. So you only want to hold positions that you would buy today. If you wouldn't buy them today, you want to sell them. That's clear, right? Okay, great. So now, obviously, the best thing that you could do is clear the decks. Okay, so we don't like to close accounts in the losses. So you could actually just sell everything. It, let's imagine there were no transaction costs. So it's free to sell everything. Then I would tell you to sell everything every Monday morning. So that would solve it. And then you have to now decide whether you're going to buy these things back. So clearing the account allows you to reset and start back fresh. Now, obviously, that's impractical because there are transaction costs. So I don't actually want you to sell everything every morning. <laughs> Please don't do that. Um, uh, but if you can, like, I mean, this is something that you see with poker players. Actually, there was a really wonderful study that was done on um, uh, people who were playing slot where uh, they had their like player card data. And uh, during the day, if they got into the losses, they started, they would keep playing, they'd play longer, they'd increase their risk and whatnot. And they'd start betting more and more and being more and more irrational. But then if they quit for the day and came back the next day, they would go back to what their normal risk attitude was. So it's the clearing the decks, right? Okay, I've had to cash out. Now my, I've cleared the losses out of the mental account. Now I've got to start again. So this is, this is something if people want to look, sort of look up a lot of Richard Thaler's work, it's, it's this mental accounting problem and we can't kind of trick ourselves. We can't do this Jedi mind trick to make it better. Okay, so if you can sell it with no transaction costs, you should probably do that and then, and then start fresh. But outside of that, outside of that, you're just going to have to go back to kill criteria and acquitted coach. So what the kill criteria allow you to do is to say in advance, is this something that I would hold? So if you're doing, say, a Monday portfolio review, part of the, that portfolio review, you know, depending on your, uh, the duration of the hold, should be re to review the kill criteria. So is there anything new? Is there a new monkey that's come up? Is, is there an adverse signal that I'm now thinking about that I'm going to see in the future? and so on and so forth. So you, you're refreshing on some sort of regular cadence what those kill criteria are. And it's really good if you partner up with somebody else who can see your portfolio more clearly than you can. And those things are all going to help you. But it's all this pre-commitment devices that are actually going to help you. Um, so, I mean, I, everybody does what you do. Everybody does what you do. So I'm going to ask you to stop doing that. <laughs> Will do. So, um... You mentioned uh, Daniel Kahneman, how you spoke to him and, and how he has Richard Thaler as a quitting coach, which obviously, you know, like you said, we should be so lucky. We, we should be so lucky. And you know why? Because he knows he's not rational when he's in the middle of a research program at knowing would I start this today? He's not going to give a good answer to that. So my, my question more is just on, I guess, on, you know, the nitty gritty of finding a quitting coach. So like, for instance, investing, it's not. It's not exactly the type of thing that everyone uh, who you associate with, you know, your friends and family care about at all. Yeah. Or have don't, any... don't have them be your quitting coaches. Yes, exactly. So I'm just interested, like, I, I, you'd have to get a quitting coach who hopefully has some something invested in you, hopefully a friend of some sort. But like, once you get them, you know, what are what are kind of the steps? What are the um, what are the. You, you know, what are you asking them specifically to do just to help you make better decisions? I was interested in getting into the nitty gritty of that a little bit more. So when you find it, when you find someone you think is going to be good. So, you know, I, I, for example, I think that solo PM should pair up. Um, one acting as a quitting coach for the other and vice versa, right? Like that, that's why they should pair up. Um, one of the really important things about a quitting coach, and this is true what whether you're an investor or you, you actually have someone that you're going to uh, because you're wondering if you should 
leave a relationship or a job or whatever, is that there has to be an act of permission giving. Uh, and the permission has to be for, for you, Kyle, to, to tell Annie what's in my long-term best interest. And the reason for that is that you're going to have a tendency to think that you're being nice to me by telling me what you think I want to hear. Um, so if I'm in a relationship and I'm asking your advice, you're probably not going to tell me you should break up with that schmo. Because it's like you think that you're hurting my feelings, right? Or no, this, the, you know, your startup is going nowhere. Why don't you shut it down? Right? No, you're going to be like, rah, rah, rah. You should keep going at it. I know you can do it. Keep trying. You're so smart. You're so great. So the first thing is that I have to, you, I have to tell you, I, I don't worry about my short term best it, like what you think is my short-term feelings are going to be. I don't care if you hurt my feelings in the short run because I want to know that I'm doing well in the long run, right? So I don't want Eric Seidel to tell me I played a hand great because he doesn't want to hurt my feelings. That's really bad for me in the long run. So I have to tell him, I want to know what you really think. And if you think I butchered the hand, tell me that because otherwise you're really hurting me in the long run. So that that's the first thing is that there has to be this permission given. Give, give um. And then the second thing, it's really, as I said, it's about figuring out what's realistic in terms of, of the setting of kill criteria, uh, kind of running that by them in a neutral way and saying, so what do you think are the signals or, or do you think these things are reasonable? Uh, and then committing to actually following those. And maybe you can actually do like a little, um, you know, like a kill criteria review with them and sort of set that up on a regular basis. And do the same thing for them. So, and and the reason why you really want, like, part of the reason why you want an outside view, and I'll give you like a simple example of this, on on the setting of the criteria in the first place is let's imagine that you're 21 years old and you just got your first job out of college and you come to me as your mentor and you say, well, I'm going to quit this job if I don't get a promotion within six months. I have a lot of experience and I can tell you, uh, hey, seems to me that's unreasonable. I don't think that you, 21-year-old Kyle, should have the expectation that you should be getting a promotion within six months. And why don't we delete that as a kill criteria? You know, and then I can say it's more reasonable for you to say like within 18 months that you get some sort of something, like some bump or a title change or whatever. But we can figure out whatever that is. But so I can sort of tether you to reality. Like when we go back to way back when we were talking about this idea of like applying your own experience to what are the chances my restaurant is going to succeed. If you go talk to another person, you can look up the base rates and see that only 40% succeed. But you can also talk to someone who's opened a lot of restaurants and they've been in the industry for a long time. You say, I think there's an 80% chance my restaurant's going to succeed. Tell me if I'm being unreasonable and don't tell me because what you think I want to hear. Like, I really want to know, right? I need you to tell me the truth here. They're probably going to say that's, not yet. Like 80% is a ridiculous number. No, it, you have to downgrade that. So uh, that's where that they can be really helpful. If you give them permission to tell you the truth, they can help you both on the setting up of the kill criteria, and then they can also help you to adhere to it. So it's like getting you into the right area of like expertise, expectations and criteria and that kind of thing. So Annie, I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show today. This was an incredible conversation. Um, where can the audience learn more about you and your books? Okay, well, they, I'd love for the audience to go to the Alliance for Decision Education. That's the nonprofit that I mentioned where we're trying to bring uh, these types of concepts to K through 12, right? Like how do you become a better decision maker? Um, I think that uh, more, much more important than teaching trigonometry going back to our transfer of training thing, which doesn't really do anything for you unless you're going to be a structural engineer. Um, so, uh, so I really love for people to visit that. Um, but other than that, um, you know, I have a sub stack called Thinking and Bet. Um, people can catch me there. Uh, I teach on a platform called Maven. Um, that's where the public can get my teaching. I also teach at Wharton, but you know, you could enroll in one of my classes at Wharton, but it, you got to travel there and whatnot. But Maven is online. Um, so I'd love people to go check out maven.com. Um, 
Uh, and then AnnieDuke.com, uh, you can go find out my goings on. And uh, you want to hire me for something, you could contact me there. Um, you know, and I'm active on social media, but uh, most of the things that I'm really doing is are on Substack. There was a lovely study done by McDonald's that showed for one week, every family that came in to the McDonald's location received a balloon for each of the kids. Half of them got the balloon as they were leaving as a gracious thank you for frequenting our, our restaurant, right? The other half got the balloons as they came in. They got the balloons first. Those parents bought 25% more food. 